Hi, my name is Jayakumar Hariyaran. I'm an executive coach, speaker, and author. Stories That Shift is a series of intimate conversations with CXOs on what makes them tick. Stories are not what we say, stories are who we are. And I have a very interesting guest on the shoot today. Somebody who wears a lot of hats. The vice chairman and founder of InfoEdge, a Padma Shri awardee, and also a founder of Ashoka University. And this is just some of the things that he has uh, managed to achieve. Sanjeev, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for calling me. Sanjeev, as somebody who's worn a series of hats, it's always fascinating to get back to the origin story in terms of the hero's journey kind of a parlance, but a little bit more about contemporary uh, adventures that you've been on. What has kept you busy the last six months? Well, I think uh, I now I'm involved in the company's uh, venture funds. So investing in startups is what has kept me busy for the last few years. Of course, I get involved in board matters, governance matters, some media, external uh, facing uh, roles such as inter interface with the government. Uh, but uh, maybe 70-80% of my time goes into meeting startups and uh, helping the team that invests in startups. Amazing. Any high points that you'd like to celebrate, either professionally or personally? No, I think it's uh, not any one high point. I think you work every day and uh, you're in the trenches every day and uh, you do your work and then whatever happens, happens. Amazing. Amazing. Um, well, I was checking on some of the interviews that you've done. I found something really fascinating. I was aware of two of the origin stories, that is namely Zomato and uh, Policy Bazaar. But your own story of Naukri was a little bit of a discovery for me. And I hope it will be a, a bit of a discovery for other people as well. Do you want to just briefly take us on that story, the Business India the magazine would get circulated. Sure. Actually, um, I'll go back even further. In 1989, I was uh, graduating from IIM Ahmedabad. And uh, prior to going to IIM, I had uh, got three years of work experience in advertising in Lintas. And in those days, companies would come to hire uh, freshers from the IIMs. So even if you had prior work experience, they would offer you a job as a management trainee. Uh, and I wasn't prepared to write off my three years of experience. So I said, let me go outside placement uh, to a company that's not coming to campus because uh, you, the rule said you can do that. You can go to companies not coming to campus and approach them directly. And let me see if I can get a lateral entry into a company and not as a trainee. So I uh, applied to a company then called HMM, now called GlaxoSmithKline Consumer Healthcare uh, and uh, for a job in the marketing team. And I was called for an interview to Delhi and I went and I uh, got the job offer and I came back uh, and I went to the placement chair, uh, Professor Srinivas Rao, and I told him, sir, I have got a job um, and I'll be opting out of placement. He said, excellent news. I hope you haven't broken any rules. I said, no, I haven't. This is the job I've got. Uh, and the company's not coming to campus, so it's fine. He said, yeah, that's fine. He says, now I want you to volunteer and help me in placement. I need as many uh, hands on the deck as possible. I said, sure thing. So there were three, four of us who were not going through placement. The others were mostly people who were writing the civil services and they had deferred the placement for a year, uh, which they would avail of should they not clear the exam. So there were three or four of us uh, who were given the job of being a concierge, mm -hmm. which basically meant that uh, the recruiting teams would come to campus. So they would, uh, you know, you would meet their taxi at the gate, the car at the gate, and then uh, uh, you know, meet them and then uh, escort them to the interview room, uh, make sure tea, coffee, biscuits are served, uh, make sure that uh, the, the interview is lining up on time as per in the right order. Uh, you would escort them for lunch to the MDC, the Management Development Center, uh, which was uh, a big incentive because that food was much better than the, the mess food that we would get. And uh, then in the afternoon, again, um, uh, take them back to the interview room, uh, tea, coffee, biscuits, candidates. At four o'clock, they'd wind up and they would go to the placement office and submit their list of candidates that they're making offers to. They're making offers to. And then you'd see them off at the gate. So we had to be with them the whole day, uh, a kind of concierge and make sure things went off smoothly. Um, now, on day one of placement, uh, in those days, you know, day one was day one. It was not day zero, not day minus one, the way it is today. Day one of placement, there were four companies. Uh, it was Citibank, Bank of America, uh, uh, Procter & Gamble, and Hindustan Lever. Now, 
this is 1999 pre liberalization so no consulting companies right, no right, investment banks right. no nothing these are four companies and these are decided by student votes as to which company will come on day one now all the interviews were happening in uh, the basement of dorm 2 mm-hmm. 10 rooms four interviews four companies so city bank had come with uh, with with eight interviewers and so they got four rooms they running four interview panels gotcha. lever had only come with four interviewers mm-hmm. they got two rooms yeah two interview panels the lever head of hr mm-hmm. who was there and these are all alumni sure right they know the institute they know the way around they know the profs they know everything they know how the system works the lever head of hr got worried saying that uh, city bank has got four panels we got two they'll process candidates faster than we will they will make offers uh, now if you accept an offer you are a placement so they make an offer and it gets accepted across the table then people won't even come for our final interviews we lose talent so what he began to do was he began to flip between the two panels and if he liked a person across the table he would immediately take out a, a, a offer letter offer letter uh, fill it up and say sign accepted right now walk me to the placement office and get out of placement you're not going for next city bank interview now this was completely against placement rules sure because you are allowed to get two job offers before being mm-hmm. before being placed out if you accept a job offer uh, you could you know you you were placed out and you could sit on a job offer for two days mm-hmm. and uh, while deciding whether to accept or not after which it will lapse if you don't accept it so this threw the whole placement uh, system out of gear that year right uh, eventually the city bank people found out that this is what is happening and there was uh, words exchanged uh, between city bank and lever and uh, you know there was utter chaos and that night a uh, uh, town hall a gbm was held all the students 30 40 professors wondering what to do and uh, so the rules were placed on a chain that year uh, because of this action by uh, uh, lever but for me it was a customer insight i got my first product idea from there right and i said to myself that if somebody would do a salary survey if company would compete like this on campus for for at the iams you know the phrase war for talent war had, for not, talent, yeah. had not been invented or, Absolutely. or certainly it was not popular then yeah and i never heard of it but i witnessed it right and i said to myself that if companies are going to compete like this okay then if somebody would do a salary survey of what companies are paying fresh mbas from the iim campuses that product would sell because it will be one more useful input sure. in your decision of what to offer so as to be more attractive on campus because there's intense competition and that was our first product and it did well sure. maybe 2 years later uh our second product so i had a co-founder then uh and his uncle was one of india's leading uh, intellectual property attorneys you know mm-hmm. trademarks patents copyrights designs mm-hmm. um now under the trade there's a trademarks act in india uh, under the trademarks act if you register your trademark or brand name uh you get exclusive right to use it within india for that product category so it made eminent sense for companies to register their trademarks the only problem was that it took 5 years for the government to say yes or no right uh, no company wants to wait 5 years before launching a product or brand right you will wait maximum one year two years uh, one big reason for rejection of uh, your trademark application was that there is a identical or similar trademark applied for before you or registered before you to first come first served so the companies what they would do is that they would hire trademark attorneys and say please go and search the record of uh, registered and applied for trademarks which is open for public inspection at the trademark registry office in fort in bombay and let me know chances of acceptance or rejection right so uh, my co-founder former co-founder had um, done a summer internship in college at his uncle's firm and his uncle had told him uh, son we have this uh, swiss pharma company client uh, which is wants the following three trademarks uh, registered in india can you go down to bombay and just do a search on the trademark registry library on the record of public inspection and check uh, 
if there's any conflict with any other earlier application or registration. Now, Kapil went to Bombay, my former co-founder Kapil Varma, he went to Bombay and he came back and he said, man, the system is broken. I said, mm. what? He said, first of all, there are 600,000 registered and pending trademarks in India. This is 1989. Sure. Right? Now there are many more. There are 6 lakh registered and pending trademarks in India across 32 product categories. And now there are 42, and that time there were 32. Um, and the single biggest category is pharmaceuticals with 80,000 trademarks. Which means the highest chance of a conflict oh, absolutely. is in pharma. Pharmaceuticals, yeah. And he said this record is not maintained on computer. Mm. It is not maintained alphabetically in registers. Mm. It is maintained in reverse chronological order of date of application in files with two pages to an application. Which means that to search the pharma record, <laughs> one lakh sixty thousand times. Jeez. For this, now the way the industry worked is that a large company will hire an expensive lawyer. That expensive lawyer will have a lot of will, assistance. Will, 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 will retain a slightly less expensive lawyer in Correct. Bombay. Yeah. Who will then give to somebody who will subcontract it when the guy who is actually doing it was being paid 150 rupees per okay. trademark. So you have to get 150 rupees to do this one lakh sixty thousand times. There is no way it's going to be a reliable search. Now it's also time consuming. Because he said that, look, a person who's doing class 5, which is pharmaceuticals, will wait for 10 or 20 or 30 trademarks to accumulate before doing this one like 60,000 times. Mm. Because then it becomes worth his while. Yeah. Which means it takes about six weeks to do a search because you're waiting for it to accumulate, the batch to accumulate, then you'll do it. Yeah. Right? And he says, because it's manual, it's hopelessly unreliable. So he said, you know, I went there, there were these extremely low tech kind of lawyers who probably could get no other job. They're smoking, drinking chai, doing this, talking, <laughs> you, know, you know, and, uh, you know, out of the corner of the eye, they're looking at the list. He says, there is no way this process is reliable. It's broken, and companies are spending crores of rupees to launch a brand. Sure. On, on the last mile link is this, right? So he said, if we are able to transcribe the pharma record and put it on a computer, we will uh, sell searches, computer searches. This is 1990. This is pre-internet, this is pre-land, this is pre-everything. Oh my God. Okay, but if you just somehow get it, uh, we can sell computer researches. So I said, great, go ahead. Uh, now we, you know, so he went to Bombay, uh, by Rajdhani Express, stayed with a friend, hired 10 kids from Elphinstone College, made them cut class, paid them 700 rupees a day each, uh, paid the library fee, got registers, okay, and said, I want these five or six items of information on each application copied, transcribed into this register. And he came back in a month's time with two suitcases of registers with the pharma trademarks uh, re record transcribed. We went and gave it to a data entry company and we had a database of uh, 80,000 uh, pharma trademarks. Uh, I uh, looked at my solved examples. I'm not a techie, but in IM I'd done two, three courses in computers. So I took out the textbooks, looked at the solved examples, I sat overnight and hammered out a piece of code, which uh, was very clunky, but it did the job. Uh, and you would input a string, it would search the record, come out of the shortlist, maybe a couple of hundred, maybe 300, which you could visually inspect and shortlist uh, manually and say, okay, here's a trademark search report. So what used to take six weeks or maybe three months, now can be done in an hour, right? And we got a directory of pharma companies from various pharma associations, built a database, 5,000 mailing list. And we uh, sent them all letters and brochures saying we can do this, 1,000 rupees report in 24 hours, 350 rupees report in one week. Um, and we sent them the brochure and we began to get, get business. So we had this database. We had to update it by a new file every month. There'd be a new file every month. Uh, and uh, beyond that is a 95% margin business, right? Now, not a big business, a niche business, maybe two, three, four lakhs, uh, you know, a month, maybe maybe a couple of lakhs a month. Uh, and uh, we were prof we, we were breaking even and making a profit because we had found a niche. Now, what I when I look back at both these businesses succeeded on a small scale, but they succeeded. Uh, they succeeded without having to sell very hard. The customers wanted the product. Both what you call natural traction? What I call natural traction, now. Now, yeah, okay. sure. Uh, but 
I think the key message is that successful businesses are built on deep customer insights. Deep customer Amazing. insights about what? About unsolved problems. You know, you have that insight. You know, if you come out with a solution, a product, it will sell because the, the customer will want it. You won't have to sell. Customer will buy it. Right? And that's what happened to the salary survey. That's what happened to trademark search service. Both were small businesses, tiny businesses. No, I think what's encouraging is the fact that um, to get great insight, you got to be insanely curious. You got to wear that lens of curiosity about things around you that are working, not working, at play, and what somebody might need. Maybe I th- not I th- now. I think you're the future. keen student of human behavior. Beautiful, Sanjeev. Beautiful. If you observe human behavior, if you try and understand it, and you say, "Listen, what can I get from this?" maybe you'll get an idea a week i don't know maybe you'll get an idea a day i don't know maybe you'll get some ideas sometime you got a thousand ideas i got i got had a thousand ideas uh, sure. we execute one sure. right you will execute one if you're lucky but if that works you know it can really work so the idea of nokri came about in a very similar manner uh, in my last job in hmm uh, you know there were about 8 10 of us uh, junior marketing executives uh you know sitting in an open hall and because it was an open hall i could observe my colleagues and uh i could see what they were doing and i could hear what they were saying on the phone right uh so i observed a couple of things the first thing i observed is that when the office copy of business india would come in everybody would read it from the back because in those days there were 35 to 40 pages of appointment ads in the back of business india and very often people just read department as past the magazine on they would not read the editorial and i was uh, as i said this is strange behavior and then they would start talking to each other you know there's a job going here uh, what do you think you know and they would say aren't we so badly paid right so i realize, now these are people who are actually happy in their jobs will never switch uh, the reason being that if you want delhi and fmcg fmcg <laughs> and mnc <laughs> Uh, and marketing, not sales, which means head office. Got it. There were just two companies. Sure. Uh, Nestle and H M M. And uh, observed behavior was that they would not hire from each other. Correct. So, which means that you are in the best job you could be. It can't get better than that. <laughs> and the company did pay badly, actually. You know, but uh, but you know, people are into comparing and benchmarking, sure. and it is competitive. And how am I doing versus others? What's happening in the market? Am I being left behind? It was that kind of FOMO. What is now called FOMO. Sure. Uh, you know, that was the behavior. and i said okay fine jobs are a high interest category of information insight number 1 the other thing that would happen is because there were 8 10 of us all from the iims and uh, the good business schools bajaj fms this is a good head hunting ground for head hunters if you wanted people to fmcg mnc uh, marketing yeah talent right so every week there would be two or three calls from a head hunter the other and i could hear my colleagues talk on the phone sure and they would then you know feel very good about it and they don't apply and say you know so and so called up this job you know that same conversation would start and i realized that these jobs are not advertised not in times of india not in economic times not in business india and i figured that every time it's a different head under with a different job in a different company not at advertised, unadvertised jobs so i figured that what appears in print is the tip of the iceberg there's a massive market below the surface which is being filled by head hunters direct applications the way i applied to hmm uh, you know uh, uh, employee referrals right informal that time there was no employee referrals you know uh, uh, you know methods but uh, formally but uh, but people would refer their people they knew to the to the hr department right and uh, that's quite an intuitive leap no from seeing that these are the ads that are coming into the mainstream media but there's still like this chunk which is empowering consultants and head hunters and whatever that is a bit of a well i look uh, you know i was curious about business opportunity because i wanted to be an entrepreneur right and i said man there's something here i couldn't figure out what and how i said there's something here and uh, you know uh, Okay, it became one of those file and forget kind of insights, mm. right? I went out into the salary survey, uh, and then the trademark database we did, and uh, life went on, right? And around 
the Department of Telecom advertised in a big 40 by 6 ad, I think in Hindustan Times or Times of India in Delhi, saying we are launching a video text network, V-I-D-E-O-T-E-X. Video text was a system that was popular in Paris in France. Uh, they had tied up with French Telecom mm -hmm. to bring it to India. The concept was that there would be, in one telephone exchange, there'd be a server. Mm -hmm. On that server, there will be databases. Mm -hmm. And there'd be public access terminals in 50 or 100 places around, this is pre-internet, right? Public access terminals yeah. in 50 or 100 places around Delhi, uh, where public could pay money and access the databases. Right? So they advertised for PIPs, private information providers, people who would own and maintain these databases and there'd be a revenue share agreement with the DOT 50-50 that whatever revenue comes you can take 50% we take 50% and uh, it's okay so th we want proposals from PIPs with their ideas of what databases they'd like to do so penny dropped in my head and I said we will apply to do a database of jobs mm -hmm. so we sent in a proposal uh, we, were, we were shortlisted we were called and you know, it was one massive conference room, and there were some 30, 40 other companies there. And there was, uh, uh, and coincidentally, by the way, the person anchoring this, uh, so there's DOT, the implementation partner of the company called TCIL Bell South. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The GM in TCIL Bell South anchoring this uh, was Rakesh Verma, who is now the, uh, the founder of Map My India. Wow. Okay. okay. He had just come back right. from the US and okay. he was working in TCIL Bell South, and uh, he was anchoring this project. We called it JobNet. We were shortlisted and selected. And they gave us two software programs on their side. They will work with you. So we used to go meet them, brief them. You know, I had done a back handwritten, you know, what is now called navigation. But then I just said, first bit will be this. And you click and you go here. Got you know, it. I'd done the whole tree. Got it. Right? I'd done the whole uh, job uh, database structure. All that I'd done. And they were working on it. It was taking time. Because the same two people were working on three, four different companies. And there was a certain date for launch. Six months later, we got a call saying, uh, please come in, we want to talk to you. Yeah. Once again, large conference room, same 30, 40 people who were shortlisted earlier. These folks, we're very sorry. The government has withdrawn the budget and shelved the project. Mm. So this is not happening. But by then, we had the whole concept fleshed out. So, file and forget. Uh, okay, great idea, can't be done, put it away keep on doing salary service, databases, teaching, training, writing, consulting, whatever you're doing. October 96, I went to Prakati Medan. There used to be a, an exhibition uh, organized every year called IT Asia. Mm -hmm. It was organized by CII every year. So I used to go just to potter around. Uh, no, no agenda. You know, just see what's happening. Sure. Right. Now, 96 October, I went and there was IT Asia happening. And uh, so it was across three or four pavilions. Two or three pavilions were of these large companies. Mm -hmm. You know, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, Compaq, Dell, you know, uh, all those large companies with expensive solutions which uh, we could not afford and where we already knew about the solution because we'd seen the ads in the magazines. Got it. So those pavilions were of no interest to me. But there was this one last pavilion mm. where there were some three or four hundred tiny stalls of small companies from all over India. Got it. These were distributors of tech products, uh -huh. uh, you know, software distributors, small software companies, some computer-based tutorial company. So if you, it was like the Kumbh Mela of, uh, you know, tech in, in, in those happening, days. What's what, happening what, yeah, in the, the soft yeah. underbelly of uh, the tech space. So if you want to get 300 ideas, you go there. <laughs> okay, Got because you will get, you will see it. what's happening. So I saw one stall which said WWW. Mm. I was wondering, what is this here? So I went to the guy and said, what is this? So he said, so this is email. Now, this guy was a reseller of VSNL. VSNL was a public sector yes. company. Yes. It had the monopoly Correct. for internet access in yeah. India in 1996. Uh, internet had just come into India. And so I asked him, what is this? He says, email. Now, I had vaguely heard of email. I didn't know what it was, and I had never seen it. I didn't know anybody who had email. Sure, 96. Yeah, and I said, really? Uh, how does it work? Show me. So uh, he had a computer. 
and he had a second computer. Uh, both had devices attached to which, which he said, sir, this modem. Hai. This is a modem. I've never seen modem in my life. So he dialed something, and the modem made ching, ching, that sound, and he logged in. And he says, see, I've logged in now. Yeah, this is the interface. Now I'm going to send an email to somebody, another account, and I will access it on the other computer. So he sent an email. He went to the other computer, logged in again, and accessed the mail. He said, now this computer could have been the US, could have been anywhere. So you can communicate with anybody asynchronously. This is much cheaper than fax. He was positioning against fax. And so, you know, it's fantastic. It's this, it's that, it's that, whatever. So I heard him out and I said, man, this is going to be a complete failure. So he said, why? I said, look, even if I take an account, I don't know anybody who has email, who will I send an email to? <laughs> so if I'm the only guy with email, he's a, he's a failure. Sure, sure. I began to walk away. Got it. Right? He said, no, sir, come back, come back, come back. I went back. He said, sir, this is also internet. I'd never heard of the internet. I said, what is internet? He said, sir, internet is, you can sit in your home office on your computer with your modem, dial into your internet account, and you can access information in tens of thousands of computers across the world. I said, really? I got very interested. I said, really? This person has done a fantastic job <laughs> so far. <laughs> okay. Yeah, amazing. Show me. Yeah. So he logged in again, and he went to a site called Yahoo. And I said, okay. Uh, so he said, okay, now you can either search or you can browse. I said, let's search. They search for what? I said, let's search for India. Results came out. Uh, there were no real sites mm -hmm. at that time, 96, I mean, one or two maybe. Uh, but it was mostly small one or two pages on each website maintained by some NRIs. So there was a site on the Taj Mahal, there was a site on something, you know. Some. I said, this is interesting. And the penny dropped in my head and I said, why don't we do the jobs database on this? So I asked him, I said, how many internet users are there in India? He said, sir, there are 14,000 internet accounts in the country. Now, 14,000 internet accounts is which shared accounts will be about a lakh to lakh. Mm -hmm. it, looked like a, it looked like a large number to me, mm -hmm. right? I had no idea what will happen to the internet, where it will go, how fast this base will grow. But I said, yeah, two lakh hai, to, you know, kuch ho sakta hai. Right? And uh, I said, look, I don't want internet access, you're too expensive anyway. But I want to run one of those servers mm -hmm. which others access. So he says, sir, those are only in America. You can't do it out of India. So that night I went, I called my brother, the prophet at UCLA. And I rang him up and I said, uh, you know, I want to start a website on the internet. Um, I need a server, but they're not in India. He says, no problem, I'll get you a shared server. For $25 a month, he got a shared server which he was picking up the tab for. And uh, he sent me the IP address. I said, you can log in from India and you can do your stuff. I went to a friend who was a very good programmer, freelance. And I said, look, I want to start a website and uh, I don't have money, but I'll give you a percentage of the company. Can you do the work? He said, yeah, I, let me try. I've never done it before, but let me try uh, to program for the internet. After four days, he called me and said, I can do it. I read up. I went to Madras Hotel. Uh, there's a, there was a uh, something called Central News Agency there, where you could uh, get newspapers and magazines from all over India and the world. So if you want to get Malayalam and Hawaiian Delhi, uh, right? You would get it there. You they will deliver it to your office by the afternoon. Oh, it catches the morning flight. Oh, okay. Comes to Delhi. Got comes it. To them, got and it. And they deliver it. Got it. Right. And I went through all the papers from all over the country, and I said, okay. On this day of the week, I want this paper, on that day of the week, on that paper. And I identified 29 newspapers and magazines which carried appointment ads. I said, I want these. So, this is send a peon every day. He'd pick up the day's thing and send the money. So, every day a peon would go, pick up the newspapers. We would, I had two data entry operators who would input the jobs in our own words into a database. And the database would go to Anil Lal's house, uh, my friend who was a programmer. And uh, I, give, I dug out the old brief of the job net service. We named it Nokri, and uh, I did the programming. And twice a week, uh, the, he had internet access. Okay, twice a week, uh, 
floppies would go to his house. Amazing. And he would upload the site uh, twice a week. And that's how we started. But once again, customer insight. That, uh, you know, I observed the customer and I figured that uh, jobs are high interest category of information. I figured that there's a massive database of jobs that is not in print. So we can aggregate that somehow. So we started off taking jobs from newspapers, but then we mailed everybody and said, uh, look, we know you don't advertise all your jobs. You can put the other jobs here. It's just 6,000 rupees a year. And uh, send your jobs and uh, we'll put them up. And jobs and revenue began to come. Amazing. Um, actually, I want to dial back a little, little more, right? Because, you know, formative years, parents, brothers become like role models. They went into academia and what, despite going through such a pedigree in terms of, you know, uh, be it St. Columbus, be it uh, St. Stephen's and IMA, but you never thought academia. You, you, did, did you always march to the tune of a different uh, drummer? Well, actually, uh, I was not that interested in studies. My brother was a brilliant student. Sounds a bit rich, Sanjeev, considering. No, no. no. <laughs> See, I would do, I would study hard for the exams that mattered mm. to do well enough to get into the college or the MBA program I wanted to. But once I was there, I didn't really work that hard to warrant a career in academics and a PhD. And I just wasn't that interested. I was capable, but did not apply myself. Interesting. Okay, so my ambition was always to be an entrepreneur. Wow. Since I was 12 or 13 years old. And, you know, talking about insight, because, um, you know, some time ago, I wrote a piece which compared uh, executive coaching to advertising or branding and uh, people in the executive coaching fraternity got a bit ruffled by that. But then I explained, look, look, before you get in, Nick has in a twist. The basis for this is the Jungian, you know, uh, archetype. And essentially, from an advertising or a marketing point of view, you're moving somebody else's behavior to benefit you as the brand in question. But in executive coaching, you move it to the person. So you essentially, if you want to have a behavioral change, you run a media you know, campaign for yourself. You figure out what does that need and how do you fulfill it and so on and so forth. So which is why your take on in, in insight was extremely interesting to me. And one of the most important things that I subscribe to is being politely curious about the world. Like how you saw Business India magazines and you know, Thousands of people saw the same thing. Getting an insight, would you say what, is 50%? I would say uh, getting the right insight will give you the right idea, mm. right? Uh, or an idea that will work without trying too hard, right? You won't have to sell that much. It'll sta it has its own legs to yeah, stand on. Th that's really important. So it's not as if it's 50% or 60% or 40%. It's that, look, it's essential. There's a, necessar there's a necessary condition and a sufficient condition. So a necessary condition is that uh, you have to have the right idea based on a customer insight. The sufficient condition is you got to execute well, work hard, build a team, uh, make it happen. You need both. So if you go back to calculus uh, <laughs> and uh, differential calculus, dy by dx, there's a necessary condition and a sufficient condition. You need both. And I think there is another factor that you spoke about, uh, luck and frugality, which have also played interesting roles in your journey in different uh, kinds of, uh, at different stages. Amazing. Uh, Sanjeev, at this point in time, I want to ask you, what motivates you more? The gratitude about the distance you've come or there's more to it, the so, future? So, so I'll tell you, um, you work on a daily basis mm -hmm. and you work for the day, mm -hmm. right? You don't think too much, mm -hmm. right? And whatever the outcome happens, happens. Okay. Now, having said that, uh, the truth is that I get motivated when I meet young people uh, with, fresh, with fresh ideas. So that gives me energy that, you know, piques my interest uh, and that keeps me going. The team I work with, mm -hmm. uh, the oldest person is 35 years old. Wow. So I'm, uh, I'm 60. The anthropology back are very often much younger. Absolutely. How do you manage the the energy transfer i mean what's what's running through your mind and how are you unlearning you know in the process and also learning new things from a younger so coterie uh, so i mean younger so, ecosystem no, look we have our ideas mm -hmm. we have our fixed ideas and mm -hmm. notions mm -hmm. we have our beliefs yeah uh, and we also know that ours may not be the only way sure and therefore when somebody else comes along um and we think he or she can do it we back them a little bit of money 
uh, we let them run with their ideas and there we make gentle suggestions. Uh, they may or may not listen. Uh, and if it works, we learn something. Amazing. Right? So there are so many times when Deepin, I would give Deepin advice, he would disagree and not listen. Right? And the first nine times I was always right. The <laughs> tenth time, he was. I was wrong and he was massively right. <laughs> and that's what made the difference. Wow. So I kept telling him, don't do food delivery. So I told him, don't, don't, don't go international. He went international. He had to pull it back. I said various things. Sure. Right? Uh, the last time uh, was, uh, he said, I want to do food delivery. Mm. I said, don't do it. It's too cash consumptive. He said, he went ahead and did it anyway. As he always did all the other things also. <laughs> Uh, he, okay, and uh, this time I was wrong and he was right. Amazing. And that's what made the company. Amazing, amazing. And it's such a brilliant thing, right? Got it. You were right all this time and he was wrong, but when the big one happened. Yep. No, but you it. see, the point is that we were we would always suggest, right? Sure. See, nobody becomes an entrepreneur because they're looking for a new boss. 100%. You 100%. Can't, you, can't, you can't behave like that. You, 100%. You're, you're just an investor. So you have a conversation, you bounce on ideas, you suggest. And whether or not it works, it's up to the entrepreneur. So there's still a lot of hope in the in the ecosystem because sometimes I feel that uh, entrepreneurs, as in when they get funded, they've just exchanged one boss for another. But largely that's not true is what you're saying. Um, so I think smart investors recognize they have role clarity and role consensus. It's not my job to be the entrepreneur. It's his job because he's there 24-7. I'm just the investor, right? Also understand one more thing. You are investing in a company, but you have a portfolio of companies. If one goes wrong and one goes right, you're still okay. So you have a portfolio. Mm. The founder is betting has his life. Has just one. Completely. Betting his life, he has only one life. And if it goes wrong, his life goes wrong. He loses those years. Absolutely. Right? He doesn't have a portfolio to respect that. He's betting his life. That's much more important than your money. He's got all his eggs in one direction, one, one basket. Sanjeev, one, one of the most important things is to deconstruct, a, deconstruct what a leader's journey looks like. And um, there are a series of things that have happened in everybody's lives, which kind of makes them what they are. What has happened in your journey to make you the person you are today? That's completely. Well, uh, I think part of it is childhood and growing up experience. Uh, the family I was born in. Uh, my father was a, a doctor he, he, and he made it on a scholarship because he came from a not so well off family. And it's because he topped in, he got admission and into a college where he got a scholarship and therefore he was able to carry on his studies. Um, partition happened, you know, he moved, my mother moved with her family, right? Um, and because of the loss in partition, um, he did the next best thing as he graduated. So he was in, in, in medical college in Karachi. Mm -hmm. He got a transfer to Vishakhapatnam. Mm -hmm. uh, from Vishakhapatnam to Agra. He finished medical college and he did the safest thing possible. He joined the government. Mm. Very risk of us. We are not a business family. Right? Uh, and then all through his working life, until he retired, he was with the government. Or just one job. Right? We grew up in government colonies. We grew up the message was clear that you've got to study hard. If you don't study hard, you won't make it in life because doors will not open. Sure. And you have nothing to inherit. We have no money to give you. Okay. So working hard became, uh, you know, the importance of uh, doing well enough in the exams that you got to the next level. All this became important. Right. Um, frugality came from there mm. because there wasn't that much money in the house mm. ever government servants okay uh, so those are the I went to a school where you got caned if you didn't do your homework in all boys school it was corporal punishment you had to if you any inactive indiscipline there was corporal punishment so you learn to fall in line you learn to work hard you learn to be polite you learn to be humble okay? so the behavior and values really were set there in the early years your appetite for knowledge, your appetite for... Would you say you made unconventional choices along the way? 
I did do a few unconventional things, uh-huh. uh, but always my reasons were logical according to me. Mm. Right. So I'll give you an example. So in my time, uh, all good boys did science, mm-hmm. or most good boys did science. Excellent. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Most good boys did science, <laughs> and then there was either engineering or medicine. Right. You chose your. You wrote your entrance exams, and if you're good, you cleared and you took that route. My brother went to IIT Kanpur, then I am Ahmedabad. Uh, it was expected that I would do something similar, uh, you know. And my friends were all uh, writing the IIT entrance and the engineering entrances. So I too enrolled in coaching classes. And I went and you know, and I wrote the IIT entrance. Now there was a three-year period in the middle, 1978, 79, 80. Where the country was switching over from class 11 to class 12, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but different states were switching over in different years on these gotcha. three years, mm-hmm. right? And to make things uniform, uh, the IIT folks had said you can write your IIT entrance after class 11, right? Uh, even if you are in a state which has a class 12 school leaving, gotcha. So you don't need a school leaving certificate to get into IIT. Class 11 ke baad we'll accept you. That's how make you made it, made it equal, right? And so you know, we said great. The Delhi was already class twelve. Uh, we said uh, great. We get two shots at IIT. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you know, being this uh, pushy, ambitious yeah, Indian yeah, yeah, middle yeah. class, all that, <laughs> right after class eleven, <laughs> same year, right? So we all wrote after class eleven. Uh, as luck would, several people qualified, including me. As luck would have it, I qualified. Now, when I went for the counselling. At IIT, they have a medical test. Mm-hmm. I discovered I was partially color blind. Oh! And so the guy says, uh, the doctor says, "Son, it's okay. You can uh-huh. join. There's no problem. But certain careers and certain departments will be close to you, and uh-huh. will put on your permanent medical record. But you can join." Now I was all along been had my heart set on IIT, and for the fir- you know, and I wasn't thinking. You know, I mm. was doing it because hey, they, you know. That's how you earn your stripes. You get sure, to IIT, sure. right? And my brother went there. My friends want to go there, and you know, senior batches, all the good guys went there. This is what you do, right? You go to IIT, and uh, when this happened for the first time, I actually had an existential crisis where I said, sure. I said, thought, you know, and I said, you know, if something happens, I have to drop out of IIT after two years. I won't even be class twelve pass. I won't even be high school pass. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, uh, and then I have to go back to class twelve, get a high sure, school certificate, sure, then go to college, sure, or whatever. And I said this may be a risk I don't want to take. So I didn't go to IIT. I said let me complete class twelve in school. Now what is also happening was that mine was the last year when you could write it after class eleven. Got it. The country had switched over. Got it. So and IIT was. Earlier five-year course, it was becoming a four-year course. So I said, "This is fantastic. My junior batch can't write it. All the good guys in my batch are gone. <laughs> It's becoming a four-year course. I won't lose a year. Why didn't I go to school and write the exam again next year? Gotcha. I have a good chance of getting it, mm-hmm. and uh, I won't lose a year. And I'll have and I'll have a high school pass certificate. At know, least, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I've achieved something. You crossed one. Yeah. one. <laughs> so that's what I did." Right, so that was my first unconventional decision. Now, but in that one year in class twelve, you know, because I was now in this introspection thing after this, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, existential crisis, mm-hmm. I said, you know, but why do I want to be an engineer? Mm. And I realized I don't want to be an engineer. I just want to be an IITian. I'm Beautiful. Joining, I'm I'm joining a club or tribe. I want a brand. You know, I'm good at physics, chemistry, math, so I can clear the exam, but. I don't know what an engineer does, and do I want to do that? I don't know. So I don't really want to be an engineer. I want to be an IIT, right? Uh, now, so facto, it looks like. But I think it's very, it's an interesting journey of sorts to have arrived at that. In class twelve, <laughs> right? Yeah, class twelve. Now, as luck would have it, I did well enough in the class twelve exams to also get admission to Saint Stephen's College Economics, and uh-huh. I got into IIT a second time. Brilliant. But like oh, I said, there's okay. no competition, right? Ah, uh, got it. Yeah, got it. Okay, or, or less competition. Less competition. And then I said, why should I 
Now I had done science with bio mm-hmm. in school, mm-hmm. and I got economics. Mm-hmm. So I knew nothing about economics. Mm-hmm. I said, "There's, I'm not passionate about engineering. I'm not passionate about economics. Why do I want to spend four years doing something I'm not passionate about when I can spend three years doing something I'm not passionate about?" <laughs> I went to St. Stephen's. I, I, I was about to say, maybe you, you had a tad bit of a leaning towards economics, a little little more than science no, maybe. No. But no. no. Okay. It was a lesser of the two evil choices. It was, it was a three-year thing versus a four-year thing. Uh, you know, and... Uh, and you could I, be in I Delhi and then you didn't have to travel and... You but know. no, even IIT was going to oh, be I, Delhi. IIT uh, Delhi, okay. Okay, it was going to be Delhi, you know, like okay. you. But you know, the issues are that... Uh, I was at heart a science and quant guy, mm. right? So actually, when I went to economics, uh, the first two years were okay because I loved quant. Got it. And uh, got it. You know, micro, macro, maths, calcul- sure. uh, statistics. Sure. But uh, beyond that, frankly, you know, it was out of, out of my comfort zone. Wow. Which uh, you know, uh, which had other implications, sure. right? So some subjects I didn't do well at, but I was simply not interested. So anyway, so so that's how I went to so you know chucked up IIT twice and went to St Stephen's, uh, which was an unusual decision. Absolutely. The second unusual decision was that you know my brother, uh, who had gone to IIT Kanpur and I remember that, and had begun work, after one year, uh, chucked up his job and said I want to be a job in the corporate sector, and he went to the US for a PhD. He did his PhD at Stanford University. Right. So in 1981, I had just joined college, St. Stephen's, and uh, he was just leaving for the U.S. So four or five of his batchmates from IIM Dabad had done taken the same decision, and they all had visa interviews on the same day. So the rest were out of town. So they came to our house for lunch after the visa interview. I was there, so I asked them, guys, why are you doing this? You know, you got great jobs after IMA, and uh, you know, why yeah. why do you want to yeah. quit and do a PhD? And this guy tells me. And this is one of the best pieces of advice I've ever got in my life. Uh, he says, you know, uh, we made a mistake. So I said, what? He says, we went to IIM Ahmedabad as a natural extension to IIT. Uh, we've done the under and do the postgrad. We had no clue what working life was like. Now, after having worked for a year, we figured we don't want this life. Wow. And therefore, we want to do a PhD and go to the US and become academics. And he said, and therefore my advice to you is, if you want to do an MBA, don't do it straight after college. Work for two, three years. Uh, understand what working life is like. And if you want that kind of working life, that's when you do an MBA and then come back to the corporate sector. Because you also you learn more from your MBA if you worked. And which is why 100%. the best business schools in the world, uh, in the US, insist on prior work experience because you can relate to what's being taught in class much better because you worked. Excellent. And I, the penny dropped and I said, that makes sense. Okay, and uh, so when I was finishing college, you know, after BA in uh, the 80s, you didn't get jobs easily, right? <laughs> it's not like today. Slim picking. It's not like today. There would be five or seven companies that come to Stevens. Maybe make, make 10, 12 job offers. Sure. A batch of 400. Uh, and that's it. So you almost always had to do a second degree. So you did an MA, you did an MBA, you went abroad for a PhD, or you wrote to civil services. Mm. Right? That's what you did. So, you know, you went to do law at law faculty, right? Mm. That's what, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Right? So so I had to have a backup. So I wrote the cat. As luck would have it, I got in to IM Calcutta. And as luck would have it, I got a job at Lintas. Mm. Because they had come to campus to hire for the first time. And so once again, I was tossing a coin and beginning out, should I do my MBA straight away? Should I? Or get but but I remember this advice from my, uh, my brother's friend. And I said, no, I will work and then write the cat again later, which is what I did. And I think that was a really good decision. Amazing. So you got those three years and then I am A happened. And, and I, I, I remember one tweet or, uh, you know, that he had put out talking about the need for convocation speakers and uh, at Ashoka and typically you have convocation speakers from the West who are rah rahing and you know telling you all uh, the nice things. Those are things. your role models, you know. Yeah. I mean, you watch them on YouTube. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Kurian's... Uh, <laughs> you know, I went back to 30 years ago and I said, you know, <laughs> I'll never forget that speech. And uh, all my batchmates who 
had heard that speech. We were not invited there, so some of us had heard it from the side. Sure. Not everybody. Uh, had heard that speech, remembered it when I, I put out that tweet, yeah, and, I, yeah, and yeah. I, put, I put it on, my, on, the, on the class WhatsApp group, and everybody who was there, they didn't remember the speech. He said that speech is uh, something else. Iconic, because I remember one of them replied back saying that that's when I decided to get into social entrepreneurship kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. Wow. No, so really so well, actually, you see, you know, enough people to dispute my, my, my claim because they dug out a script mm. from somewhere and said he only referred to us as a shampoo salesman only once in that speech. No, 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 no. So listen, Dr. Kurian was a great extempo speaker and the script is might have been something, but what he said was something else. Gotcha. But I'm clear about gotcha. that. Gotcha, gotcha. Because once he started on a theme, he would just go on. <laughs> <laughs> No, but for him to, very irascible, right? I mean, for him to turn up at that and uh, irreverent and, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, He's chief guest. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember you writing, you, everybody's ears are burning at the end of it. No, no, there was a graduating batch. There was the next batch from the side. Correct. There were faculty, IMS study members. There was a director. There was, there were parents <laughs> of the graduating <laughs> students. And says, so your, your, your ward is about to become a shampoo salesman. Oh, God, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Um... So I, but he was, I, he was quite a character. He was yeah, quite a character. I mean, yeah, now, now that I get to know from close quarters. So Sanjeev, one of the things that's perplexing me is, uh, I don't know your thoughts on this, all great readers don't have to be great leaders, but all great leaders necessarily have to be good readers or consumers of uh, information and wisdom. Your thoughts? No, it's absolutely correct. Uh, but uh, what has happened to me is that uh, given my work schedule and given the small screen, I have lost a significant chunk of my book reading habit. I consume content, I consume information, I consume the written word, but I don't read books the way I used to, which is a bit of a loss. Uh, I have noble intentions of going back there, but it actually never happens. But yes, uh, you know, you need to be a good reader. Excellent. No, you, I mean, it's, 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 it, it is a sign of the times that we are in. And uh, I was um, referring to Kabir uh, from uh, Swiggy. And uh, he said, I had one hobby before, which is reading books. Now I have two hobbies, buying books and reading. So to remove the guilt away from, you know, all those books that you bought and, you know, which are, you know, which you've not read. But it is definitely a sign of the times, which leads me and interestingly to a segue. There is a lot of, uh, there is an attack on on your flow and your ability to do deep work and thanks to Instagram pings and social media and you know whatever whatever what do you do or what would your advice be to senior leaders who need to do deep work how can they well, I think you do work it. on this I think I think you do it through people mm. if you can hire a great team if you can get a good team together they can, and, and, and they want to work with you, so you're that kind of person where people want to work with, who people want to work with, I think that's half the battle one. Because uh, then, you know, among the whole team, you can uh, divide the deep work, the urgent work, the immediate response, all of that. Excellent. Um, so this this change, just like leadership has undergone uh, an evolution of sorts, just like life, right? I mean, there's so many so many changes happening, and leadership shouldn't be any different from a Jack Welchian point of view in the '90s to now. What do you think would be a great leader at this point in time in the corporate stroke startup ecosystem of the country? You know, I believe the fundamentals of leadership have not changed. Excellent. Absolutely. First of all, a good people's person. Uh, you've got to be a magnet for talent. The kind of person whom people want to work with. The kind of person who people believe in you, they believe in what you're saying, what you're telling them, your vision. The kind of people who will contribute to the shared vision. Okay, and the kind of people who will become good leaders themselves. If you can get that, and of course then there's, that's the first building block. And then there, of course there's the other thing which is, uh, around strategy, around uh, uh, networking, around all those things. So this is something that I've always believed in, but off late, considering Silicon Valley and the fracas that's happening all around the world, somehow I'm beginning to get the feeling that the world is leaning on, look, the, the end justifies the means and tech is what is like the moat that I've built around. People can come and go, but uh, tech is like, you know. Uh, so I think that's a slightly short term outlook. Mm. Ultimately, all business, including a tech business, is about people. Excellent. So it is people who build tech.
right? And if you don't have great people, you can't build great tech. Excellent. Awesome. Um, Sanjeev, the idea of these conversations is also to have boundaryless learning, you know. So for a CEO, for a founder who's been through a journey like yours, what would somebody else working in, in an organization, what could they learn from you, from a leadership point of view? Is there something quintessentially different that an entrepreneur brings to the table or, or somebody who's navigated the internet's first complexities or an investor? Is, is, there a, is there a taste of what you've built, that muzzle, that you can pass on? So the first thing is, of course, know your customer, customer insights. Second thing is uh, build a great team. Right? Uh, third is uh, dream big, but start small. Because, I mean, if you dream big, uh, you know, that's what keeps you going. Uh, but you start small because you want to make your mistake small. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right? So the cost of failure is low at the early stage. And you have an opportunity to iterate and learn, iterate Correct. and learn. Fantastic. Um, any... Any other sources of inspiration that you have apart from insight that you've spoken about, which is also very curious, you know, considering that you are you you had like a formative learning in physics, math kind of a thing. Where does insight come from? Right brain, left brain? <laughs> I think uh, I was not a very confident person, right, in uh, interacting with people, dealing with people, public speaking, anything, and therefore I became a good observer and listener early on in my career. And I would speak when I was spoken to. Right? And that, in the first part of my career, I think that those traits helped me. Jeez, this is like somebody taking their Achilles heel and converting it into like a superpower of sorts. This is all hindsight. This is all hindsight. No, but you know, it, it, it just like, because, okay, let's just, let's just go back to Crossroads and see how things may or may not have panned. But if you are great at expressing yourself, great with people, Chances are sometimes you might have been low on observing, low on, you know, giving somebody that space, low on being curious. I think that's... No, that's I think as a leader, you have to have everything. Uh, however, you, you get something first and something later. Gotcha. It's what you gotcha. develop first, what you develop later, but you have to have both. Storytelling for a CXO, how important is it? It's very important because it is stories that uh, will get people to believe in you. Beautiful. And it's stories that will convince people. Amazing. Because I've seen you talk so passionately about, uh, be it Zomato, be it Policy Bazaar, be it Nokri, and uh, you're an ace raconteur now. And uh, it's, it's wonderful having this opportunity to catch up with you, uh, Sanjeev. And I look forward to being in touch and catching up with you on the next leg. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much.